My name is Kyle Morton, and I just want to tell you a little story of how I became a Christian, and I hope it'll bless you in some sort of way. So I was born and raised in the Vancouver, Canada area, with uh, no religious background at all. My parents weren't Christian, they weren't Buddhist, they were regular hard-working folk, and I was sort of a regular young child that just liked adventure, and fun, and video games, and sports. And from a young age, I had this desire in my heart that I wanted to play basketball as far as I could, while also getting my education, so when I was older, I could teach and also coach basketball. And so with this goal and this vision and this purpose in my mind, I just stuck to this narrow track and things were going, ac going according to plan to some degree until uh, I guess you could say grade 12 where I was in two English classes and also an art class. So I was reading a lot of poetry and my mind was opening to a broader horizon of thoughts than just basketball fun and video games. and. I can distinctly remember in art class too there was one specific CD that the teacher played and it caught my attention and I kept asking to to play it every class and that was the Beatles Magical Mystery Tour and with the poetry I was reading and especially the newfound love of music that I was really gravitating towards I found this new this new vision coming into my mind that was sort of colliding with the one I had since I was a childhood and eventually I found myself writing a lot more and spending a lot more time by myself. And once my grade 12 basketball season was over, and I knew that I was going to be going to a college that they didn't drug test, I decided to get together with my friends and smoke some marijuana and listen to some rock and roll. And quickly, this became an everyday habit or addiction, really. Amazingly enough, I was able to graduate and continue my academic and athletic endeavors at the University College of the Fraser Valley on a partial scholarship. And amazingly enough, also, we won the national championships. But in my own being, I was getting more and more off the academic and athletic track that I had been on since a young child, and more and more on the rock and roll and, I guess you could say, philosophical track. And in between my first and second year of college of basketball, I had a really bad trip on magic mushrooms. I couldn't look at life the same the next day, or the next week, or the next month. And I would read different books, and watch different deep thinking movies, and try and talk to friends, but there was nothing I could attach myself to, or, or flee to. And I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what condition I was in. I didn't know what life was really about. So I just continued on the same track I had been on and went to my second year of academics and athletics. But I just became more and more miserable and more and more frustrated with my state of life. And so after my second year, I didn't know if I wanted to travel, I didn't know if I wanted to continue going to school, and I was working at a graveyard gas station and I got pepper sprayed and threatened to be shot and there was a song on the radio in the background about death and so I just had my head down and I thought as far as I know if I die right now I could go to hell I, th I thought I had so much more time it's, it's like the record had stopped it was a real life-changing experience and so I decided to drop everything because I wanted to figure out what life was about and then enter back into life rather than just conducting myself in life with having no clue what I was doing. So I bought a backpack and started hitchhiking on Vancouver Island with no real direction and quickly I found myself with hippies in, in the forest and all sorts of weird adventures. I also hitchhiked to the Okanagan and I was becoming more and more aware of the unseen realm or the unseen dimension and how it 
was actually connected with the the scene realm and the scene dimension and I could never get away f from the Bible I didn't understand it and I remember in the Okanagan one time I was just walking around I was just lost just kind of didn't know what to do I saw these people gathering around this this fruit smoothie store in downtown Kelowna so I asked what it was about and supposedly there were some young people who had been going to this college or this uh, church where they taught people how to prophesy so I thought hey I mean, I, f I feel led to go in here and sit down and see what happens. And so I sit down with these two young people, and they bow their heads and close their eyes. And one of them looks up and she says, you know, God loves you. And something really touched my heart. Though that's so simple and many people could say it, it just really touched me. And then either her or the other girl sitting beside her said, I just see you walking around with your backpack, leaving footprints of gold and, and handing out cylinders of light. And I just kind of nodded and thought, oh, okay. I didn't know what to, stay, what to say or what to do. And so I walked out of there and I thought, I'm just going to go up into the mountains and get alone w with God in this Bible until something, something strikes me. But after uh, five minutes of reasoning in my mind, that didn't seem like such a good idea. And so I continued to go around in circles, not, not really sh sure how to get off, but knowing how to get off, if that makes sense. Around this time, my older brother Tyler had actually become a Christian, maybe about a year or so ago. And since you can't hitchhike in the Pacific Northwest in the winter because it's so cold, he invited me to come live with him rent-free. And so I did. But he kept inviting me to his church over and over again. And I didn't want to go because I had visited churches in the college stage of my seeking life, but it just didn't seem like the place for me. But since he was my brother and doing me such a favor, I decided I would go at least once. And it was at Cloverdale Bible Way where Pastor Ed Bisco was preaching, the breastplate of Melchizedek. And so many of my questions were answered. Even when he was talking about stuff I didn't know what he was talking about, like the Urm Thummim, Aaron's breastplate. I would think, what is he talking about? And he would say over the pulpit, if you don't know what I'm talking about, you better read your Bible. I was stunned. I felt naked. There was about 800 people there. And the only reason why I could say that I didn't become a Christian then is just because it wasn't my time. That's the, that's the only reason I could think of because I was being dealt with there majorly. But it left a mark on me that I wouldn't forget later on down the road. And time went by and I ended up working at Manning Park. And I was becoming more and more and more desperate and miserable. And I kept hearing the word Nelson, Nelson, Nelson. So I thought, okay, I'll just go to Nelson. And, I, and on the way there, I was driving. And I, all of a sudden, I realized I've, I've never driven beyond this before. And I was just about to cross a bridge. And I knew where to go, but I didn't really know where to go. And so I was putting all these symbols together in my mind. And all of a sudden something struck me and I just started praying for the, f for the first time, really. I said, Lord, if you're God and this Bible is real, I need someone to help me or something to help me. I'm so tired of going in circles. Please help. Maybe not verbatim, but it was like that. Just short and real sincere. Just cr crying out for salvation, really. And right away I, after that, I thought, nah, I haven't seen any hitchhikers for a while. That's kind of odd. And then I saw a hitchhiker, and I, I picked him up, and right away, me and him connected. We were, we were having a good time together. And he asked me where I was going, and I said, Nelson, but I'm probably going to stop in Castlegar or something and just sleep in my car. And he said, oh, just, just come to my house in Rossland, and you can, you can have a bed, you can have breakfast, and everything like that. And I thought, oh, I'm so... So thankful that this God or this spirit of this being, he, he loves me and he wants to take care of me. And the hitchhiker gave me directions on how to get to Nelson. He was actually a UBC student, but was tree planting in the area during the summer. So I continued on my adventures the next morning. And I was just, you know, just, just looking around, just, just waiting for something like, like, a, like a word in the sky or something, just telling me what to do. And I saw this man with the church church pamphlet in his pocket at this coffee shop called Oso Negro where the hitchhiker told me that that's where all the other 
the seekers and travelers go. And I asked the man with the church pamphlet in his pocket, I said, hey, are you, are you a Christian? And he was like, yes, y yes, I am. And he was actually a Quebecois pot-smoking evangelist. And me and, him, me and him got along really good. And we ended up just having coffee together and spending the whole afternoon together and the whole day together. And eventually he started telling me his testimony. And he told me about how one time he actually died and crossed over. And it's just like you would you would see it in the movies or a picture. He said it was just like there was this line drawn across the middle. In, in the top it was like clouds and sunshine. In the bottom it was just completely black with like a, a little red dot of like fire in the bottom. And he said it, he just felt like when he crossed over, he, he it's like he carried his sins with him. And, and he couldn't get to the, the upper part. So he thought he had to go down to this little red burning dot. And then quickly he was transported back into his body. And just as, as he was telling me this and other things, something just struck me. I don't know how to explain it, but it was like, I'm a sinner and the Bible is real. It was it was quite the, quite the experience. And from that time, me and the Quebecois evangelist, pot smoker spent about 30 days together and I was just pouring into the Bible just trying to figure out like something in me believe that this Bible is real now what does it say what do, what, what do I got to do where's the where's the next step where's the, where's the next point point? and I would ask qu as many questions as I could too but still it was the more I read and the more we went to every church we could in the area the more I realized there's these churches, are, are unfortunately, they're missing something. Go to church service, come outside, you smoke cigarettes. It's just something wasn't fitting. And so I decided to head back to Cloverdale Bible Way to see if they had what these churches were missing. And during this time, I was very heavily studying the first three chapters of Genesis, among other studies. I just believed there was so much depth there. And when I got back to Cloverdale, I met up with my brother Tyler and his friend Mark Stahl, who also went to Cloverdale Bible Way. I had known him before, and I asked him, What happened in the Garden of Eden? Here, Adam and Eve, they're not ashamed. Here, they're ashamed. And I said, Well, do you want to see serpents eat? He said, Sure. So we sat down, and it's just like the Bible became a new book. It was such an experience and revelation to me. My, some of my friends from the area, they wanted me to come over and play video games. And the game involved, like, it involved, like, dragons and swords and magic. And... I just couldn't do it. I couldn't even explain to them what happened to me. I just I had to get out of there. I just wanted to get into church service so bad. And I, I so enjoyed the Word of God at Cloverdale Bible Way. It was, it was such a refreshment. Yet I was still very wild and living in my car amongst sleeping on couches at my friends and my family's house. And I had got hired at a movie theater and my first shift, I went there, and they sent me home because I didn't have my direct deposit form. And I walked outside, and I thought, oh, thank you, Lord, I didn't want to work there anyways. Because the more I, I stayed around Cloverdale Bible Way, the more I realized that movies in Hollywood are not good at all. And so I thought, man, I, I wish I could have a job like I had in grade 9 with my good friend Robbie. We just dragged branches and gardened. I thought, I wish I could just do that. And so... I was also reading this book, An Exposition on the Seven Church Ages. And it said that you needed to be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you haven't, you need to get rebaptized. And so at the next service I went to, I was sitting up in the upper balcony, and there was two thoughts that were really strong on me after that service. And I was thinking that in my mind. There's two things this service makes me think as I leave here. One, I think I need to get rebaptized. Two, I still need to find a job. And so I, I walked down the stairs from the balcony and another man walked down the other stairs who knew me from basketball in high school. He said, hey Kyle, do you want a job? I said, sure. I didn't know what it was. Then I walked down the rest of the stairs and all of a sudden this sister saw me and she pulled out her glasses and she says, are you Tyler's brother? I said, yes, that's me. And someone else had just been baptized that night. And she said to me, It sure would be nice to see you in the baptism tank. 
And then the man who offered me a job came back to me, and I said, what kind of work is this anyways? He said, oh, it's tree service with dragon branches. I thought, wow. There's my gardening and branch dragon job, and there's my baptism. So I knew th with these things happening that, that this is where God wanted me. And... How are you feeling? Feel good? There's going to be several baptized, about three, I think, going to be baptized. While I was sitting here, I was thinking, we just see some people, I don't know, young men, men, women, I don't know which, all is coming to the baptism. We see them come to the baptism. But you know, this is what I was thinking of, and God brought it to my mind. No one of us really know what was going on in their hearts, in their soul, for maybe months or years prior to this moment. But God heard the cry of the shackled. God spoke to, to Job, and he said, when they couch in their den, speaking of the lions, and abide in the covert to lie in wait, who provideth for the raven his food? And when his young ones cry unto God, they wander for lack of meat. He was asking Job, do you hear them cry? Do you hear them? God understands that language and the cry from within. And I pray that the God who heard the cry of these that go to the baptism is now going to fill them to the fullness. I pray for a full measure. I pray that they'll overflow. I pray they'll be beside themselves. I pray they'll become drunk in God. I pray they'll drink at the fountain. Hallelujah! Till they lose their identity and become identified with one Jesus Christ. Amen. My, they're already there. God bless them. May God do it. Hallelujah. My. All right, you may be seated. Brother Kyle Morton standing here in the waters of baptism. He's been desiring baptism now for a while now, isn't it, Brother Kyle? Yep. All right, maybe you'd like to say something for the Lord. All right, sure. Um, last October, I was in Fort McMurray for about six weeks, uh, every day just baptizing, an aut or uh, sorry, not baptizing, um, babysitting an autistic child, and I was searching for truth every day, here and there, here and there, and I kept hearing the word revelation, revelation. So I read the book of Revelations, and it just turned my world upside down. And I was like, wow, there's something going on here with this Jesus Christ. And I, but I had no foundation. And so everywhere I'd go, people would just, they would, they would strip me of my arguments, strip me of anything I had of truth. And then so since then, I've been going this way, going that way, and going this way. And then I was traveling in the Kootenays, and I started praying again. And I was like, God, you know, please help me out. Bring someone to me to, to help me. And that day, someone came and just broke things down to me. And since then, God's been leading me in amazing ways. Um, and I've been praying about baptism. Do I need to get baptized, baptized again? Do I need to get baptized again? And people have been coming up to me and just been talking about baptism, talking about baptism. I'm like, wow, this is pretty intense. And then I read in church ages that um, if you haven't baptized in the name of Lord Jesus Christ, you've got to get baptized again. And I was like, oh, there's confirmation right there. And last October, I, was, I read Revelations, and I was reading church ages, and I fell away. And I didn't really understand it at all. I just know it flipped my world upside down. And this October, I'm reading it again, and I'm just, it's just so beautiful. It's, it's truth, and that's all I want to do is take the next step and just keep walking with Christ. Lord, such a confidence it is for the sons of God, knowing that we are led by the Spirit of Jesus Christ. And Lord, Brother Kyle stands here, Lord, tonight desiring to be baptized, not only in water, but baptized with fire. He's desiring to be identified in your death and your burial and your resurrection. Lord, he's desirous to be filled with God. I say, Lord, would you fill him? He's such an intent heart, such a desire for the things of God. I say, Lord, would you fill him, lead him, guide him, anoint him. 
and use him for the kingdom of God. Bless him now, we pray in Jesus' name. Brother Kyle, your confession that Jesus Christ is your Savior, I baptize you in true Christian baptism in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.